if me or you were trying to make $10 million this year, how would you do it? Your idea on pet supplements, a pet AG1, I think is the single best business idea oh in God. the world right now. I hadn't heard that, but that is The amazing. single best business because- I would buy it right now. It's beautiful. Like if you build a news, a paid newsletter that brings in a million dollars, chances are your margins are 90 plus percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a paid, you know, we call it a membership that is like part paid newsletter, part community, and we charge $100 a month for it. Mm. Dude, we had 20 signups in the last 24 hours. It's wild. I don't see anyone on Substack doing this, like even the biggest newsletters. The missed opportunity is realizing that the recurring revenue is the beginning, not the end. Something Dickie and I have been talking about a lot too is that spending money is a skill. And so I think part of that growth is confronting that discomfort where you have to get used to spending five grand a month, then you gotta get used to spending 10 grand a month, then 20 grand a month, you know? And if you don't allow yourself to confront that, you're never gonna feel the feeling of spending more, which allows you to then wanna go out and make more, which allows you to get to the next level, you know? Spending money is a skill. I think there's a lot of money on how to get rich, but not a lot on how to be rich. The people who make a lot of money but have a horrible relationship, I think it's the worst case scenario because you just feel this overwhelming guilt all the time that you're making a lot but not spending it. And when you spend more, you still have the same relationship with money that you had when you were making way less. I think people brag about that. It's like the rich person who drives a Honda. But I look at that, I'm like, they just haven't kind of done the work of mm -hmm. you have more security now. Why don't you invest in it? Yeah, it's like having a scarcity mindset while you're surrounded by abundance. I Okay, so... We're live on the pod. We're live. <laughs> We're just, live. I'll just tell everyone. I'll announce it to the world. There's this apartment I really want. Yep. Goal apartment. A goal apartment. I I live in a two bedroom, pretty big apartment, but I want to move into a four bedroom. And for fun, there there's this building next to me that has this that has two apartments for sale. One is they're giving it away. They're giving it away. I think it's one of the most expensive apartments in Miami. And the other one is less that I looked at, but still quite a bit. <laughs> okay. And I thought it would be fun. You know, Saturday afternoon, went with my wife to go check out the spot. Uh -huh. I checked it out and we like didn't say anything to each other because we were speechless because like we walked out of there and we just like envisioned ourselves there. I think everyone envisions themselves there. The joke, I used to have this joke with, with Alyssa. We would go for walks around Beverly Hills in LA and we'd go on the walk and she'd be like, I could really imagine us living here. And I'm like, oh yeah? yeah. <laughs> oh yeah? You and every other person I ever. I approve of this yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. So in my mind, I've been trying to decide, is this, and I'm curious your thoughts, like am I, buy, am I buying this apartment or am I considering buying this apartment for like, Maybe it, because it is the nicest building and there's some status and ego related to that. Or am I buying this apartment because I'm going to have a family one day and I want to like have the best possible environment for them. And so just how do you think about when you're making purchases? You know, are you doing this out of ego, out of status or are you doing it for? Well, if you, if you couldn't tell anyone that you bought that apartment, would you still buy it? I mean, yes. Right. Then yeah. I guess it's less ego. Yeah. Especially with apartments, you kind of want to be anonymous with what you bought. I think mm -hmm. you don't, yeah, really want, you, people you don't to want to know where broadcast you and be like, this is my address. Look at how sick, yeah. you know, that's yeah. a lot. Like the last thing I want someone to do is to pull up my, uh, and nah. like if someone pulls up your house, it's like that person lives there. That kind of looks cool until you realize that people can do that. But yeah. like, and then do, you have a family. Do uh -huh. I need, do I like, I live in a really sweet place right now. It's like, do I need, and there's like another unit in my building that I could buy. That's four bedrooms, which is a third of the price or a quarter mm. of the price. It's like, at what point is enough enough? I think what does not matter is the ticket price on the house. It's purely the monthly cash payment that you're going to outlay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if, yeah, I think a really good qualifier is if you buy it and that monthly payment causes you stress, yeah. is it worth it? That's the thing. That's, mm -hmm. that's the question. Because if you can do it and you're like, this this that's, a, there you go. that's a marginal increase and it like doesn't really stress me out that much. Because if you go down the rabbit hole of, do I really need this? Well, does anyone like, aside from basic human needs, does anyone really need, do you need to work as hard as you do? Do okay. you need to, you know? So this is a really good segue with what I want to talk about and why I came down to the Here shipyard. We are. <laughs> the shipyard. That's why we, a nice natural lead in. Here, live in Miami, the shipyard. Um, what up? Looking great. The reason I came down is if 
me or you were trying to make ten million dollars this year, or just someone was Which trying to make our current goal, we're trying to do, current, okay. yep. <laughs> how would you do it? Do you have any ideas, different trends you'd look at, niches? Like I want to spend this time basically jamming on how we could hmm. make ten million dollars, and that could be within your business, or it could be just complete, you know, other ideas that you have. Yeah, because that's the question: building off of what you currently have, or starting from cold zero nothing let's start with nothing nothing yeah <clears throat> like completely new business so I, I filled out a couple on your thing your idea on pet supplements a, a pet ag1 i think is the single best business idea oh in God. the world right now i hadn't heard that but that is the amazing. single best business because i would buy it right now it's beautiful it takes what ag1 has done which is an extremely high margin product that is a complex formula that you can't recreate there's no proof that it works or doesn't work. So you're pretty much selling placebo. Yep. And We're be, selling vegetables. Yeah. Like there, <laughs> once you're on it, you're going to say you feel better to justify the purchase that you made. No one is taking it. You want to be like, I don't feel any different. It's like, oh, I spent a bunch of money on this. I feel great. And then they have such high margin that they can just have an army of affiliates sending out the fact that they're taking it. So it's a genius marketing funnel. Should we go build this? Because I love this idea. If you did this for pets, it's even better because there's even less proof that it works. Uh -huh. Like, what are you going to ask your pet if it's feeling better from its green supplement? No. So, so, so what So what you're talking about is I went on My First Million. I, I, I pitched this idea. From that pod, one of the largest water manufacturers and water companies in the world reached out to me hmm. and said, if you can figure out what the formula is, I'll put it in the water. And we can like co-pack it together. Mm. What? I, sorry, stupid question. What does water have to do with it? So it'll be water based. Be so water you need based. like the water production oh, facility and stuff I like that. Oh, I see. Okay, got it. You're awesome. basically selling pet water anyway. Also, he has, uh, you know, he's in every Whole Foods in in the world. Uh, he's in you know every uh, Publix, every Safeway, all these big grocery chains. So if I did it with him, I wouldn't have to do just D to C. Mm. I could also be in store. Interesting. Yeah. So I think, you know, I, I, I'm definitely considering it, you know, but, the, you know, I think the reason I'm... What's the counterpoint? Why wouldn't you? I just, digital products are easier to build than physical products. Uh, significant. For sure. Yeah. But, easier, but lower upside. Yeah. I mean, this has, there are a lot of rich people who are going to put that on their credit card, start feeding it to their dog and then and never, never stop. ever once look at it again. That's right. Because the risk of stopping to give stopping giving your pet a supplement is higher risk than giving stopping yourself. Because mm -hmm. like you could feel it, but you won't see that your dog feels worse. I don't know. I yeah. like right when you said that, because I think already the smartest niche in the world, I think what we could talk about are niches that could build ten million dollar businesses. Yep. Pets, certainly one of them. Yeah. Because like Not plants even, are the new pets and pets are the new kids. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not even like the health, it's the emotional. Mm -hmm. I, I would seriously do anything. I was, <clears throat> I don't know why I had this thought last night, but I was like, if something happened to my dog and they were like, we have to do a, a life-saving emergency and it's going to cost $100,000 and insurance doesn't cover it, I'm pretty sure I would just rip that immediately yeah. and not even think about it. I love my dog, like more than anything else in the world except for my wife, you know what I mean? And so... All a supplement is, is like the reinforcement of, I care about this mm. part of my family. Totally. You know? I love you. It's saying I love you without saying I love you. Dude, and there's the marketing. Yeah. It's saying I love you every morning. Yeah. Say I love you. No, it's, it's, <laughs> I've been watching a lot of Mad Men. I got Don Draper in my subconscious. <laughs> Say I love you. Say I love you. Give him the gummy. Right. This, the little, gummy. this little vegetable yeah. gummy. Yeah. I love you. Yeah. <laughs> Bro, whenever you... <laughs> You want to, if you want, we oh, got time for a board meeting next week. I'm ready to go. Like I heard that and just, cause I think pets, I think another niche that's interesting is just general paid newsletters in any niche uh -huh. where people are going to pay for a constant stream of information that they can't find elsewhere. Yeah. So not news. I don't like, there are a lot of newsletters that have done well with just the free and sponsorship, but I think the more niche education that you can provide on a paid basis and, but still target the same niches, like, a hyper niche pet paid newsletter of you have this specific type of dog mm -hmm. and here's the ongoing mm. upkeep of just you have a Pomsky and that requires a completely different way of thinking and managing that dog and everything. Every Pomsky owner in the world would pay for that because it's so specific. 
Okay, so cool, like to validate that idea, Royal Canin, the, the dog food company, their whole innovation was we don't make, we're not gonna compete on like price or product packaging and just dog food in general. Literally all they did was just break out and say on this package, this dog food is for border collies, whereas this dog food is for golden retrievers. Mm -hmm. And there's very little, I mean, they say that there is, but come on, like there's very mm -hmm. little mar you know, marginal difference between the two. So if you think about that through the lens of education, most people are like, I'm gonna write another finance newsletter or I'm gonna write another, and they just pick the big broad category. But if you think about it like hyper specific, like I have a border collie mix. I would subscribe to a paid newsletter on how to take care of my border collie because border collies have different health mm. needs than a golden retriever would, for example. And what do you think people would pay for something like that? Is that like a ten dollar a month? Ten to thing? twenty. Yeah. yeah, ten to twenty bucks. But a then month. the thing is, you have a recurring base of purchasers that are going to buy other things that you sell because they're paying you right now. Right. Yep. That's what people don't talk about enough. Is that when when I bring up paid newsletters, they're just like, well, just paid newsletters. It's just like, okay, I have a thousand people paying me ten dollars a month or twenty dollars a month. And I'm like, to start, you do yeah. to start, then you can layer on That's other That's the services. first purchase, yeah. not the last. Yeah. Versus a lot of other companies that when you sell a one-off product, it's the last thing. And it aligns incentives for you to continue to deliver high quality information because you're gonna lose that customer and then the ability to sell them more things. Mm -hmm. right? I like that little mix and nuance of the newsletter being paid is they're continuing to pay you, which forces you to put out good content, otherwise it just all goes And create to zero. better and better things. Right. Like you're forced <clears throat> to improve. If you want to write a paid newsletter, what framework for new categories do you have? Like, how, what makes a good category versus a you know a not good category? Um, we wrote up this little checklist. We create so many things now. I'm like struggling to remember the specifics, but the the big one is like a. It has to be a very tangible mm. asset. So a lot of people are like, I'm going to start a paid newsletter, and they think that they can write about whatever, but something happens when they make it paid. That's not really what's happening. A paid newsletter, the way to think about it is it's a book that never ends. So it has to be a topic that you want to repeat infinitely, the reader wants to consume infinitely, and every issue has to feel like a tangible object. So how do you make it tangible? Like our Write With AI newsletter, every issue is here's a framework, but then here's the ChatGPT prompt. So every time I give you a prompt, it feels like I'm giving you a, a box, like an object, you know? So how do you make every issue a recipe or a, mm. you know, some sort of like designed framework or a prompt or a checklist? Like it has to feel like a thing. Okay, I have a uh, a prompt for you. <laughs> so <laughs> I have no idea where this is going. Do, do paid newsletters just become paid AI agents or paid AI <clears throat> characters? Like when I hear you talk about that. I'm like, okay, what you're saying is basically, you know, you're right with AI newsletter. I'm like, okay. So basically I'm gonna subscribe to this and you're gonna teach me basically how to become a more prolific writer in real time. And I'm gonna basically read your newsletter and then I'm probably gonna open up ChatGPT and then I'm gonna read your newsletter, I'm gonna open up ChatGPT. Is the future of education and paid newsletters more something like there's the Dickie and and Cole bot, basically, hmm. that's that you just like ping and you're like, hey, today I want to learn about how to write copy for, you know, the pet niche. And then you kind of have this conversation. Yeah, that's like, that's what agents are trying to be now, you yeah. know, that's like the whole point of that in the store. But I think it's really easy to jump to the conclusion that AI just replaces you. And AI's, AI is good at executing instructions, but it's not very good at creating net new things. Also, my, my whole take on is AI good at like completing tasks? AI is basically an intern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a like, very uneducated it's intern. It's an uneducated intern mm -hmm. that is sloppy. So if it's not doing what you want, it's, right. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's your fault if it's, it's not an, doing it. I'll say that for the camera. It's an uneducated, <laughs> uncaffeinated intern. AI. And like, love them for that. Love them. Understand that that's what you're getting. <clears throat> totally. You know? But they're a genius. Yeah. That's a thing. Yeah. If you program them right, they can do everything. Idiots. But they're just like, yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> what, where my brain jumped with, as we were talking about like the pet niche, and if you had a paid newsletter, the real upside, I think, comes in the back end in how you can create 
as many different specific paid newsletters based on the same content. So what you just mm -hmm. said clicked in my head of Royal Canine is now marketing their pet food to different dog niches. The only change they, more than likely, the only change they made is on the label with a very small mix of the product. Yeah. So if you had some kind of baseline newsletter with 500 different paid opt-ins that you could easily create with AI. So that that's where I think AI plays the biggest role is you say, I need 500 different versions of this one thing. Here's how to create one version. Now go create 500, mm -hmm. right? Because imagine how many paid newsletter opt-ins you could have for how to raise your blank pet, like this kind of dog. Mm -hmm. If you had 500 specific ones, you'd have 500 more potential opt-ins versus just here's how to raise your dog. And that's, that is the modern day Agora. Like, do you know Agora Publishing? Say, I do, but for the- Okay, it's, I mean, yeah. it's like one of the craziest, but like least well-known companies ever. And their whole business model, they By were the way, ones who I, created- I only know it because you've told me about it. Most You're people like, don't know. <laughs> And they, it's like a billion dollar company and their whole, it's just a portfolio of paid newsletters bundled with different education products. They, they essentially created that model and where everyone's brain goes is, oh, okay, a bunch of niche newsletters. Like how lucrative can that be? First, first of all, you're taking for granted recurring revenue because mm -hmm. recurring revenue is extremely valuable and extremely cushy, you know? And then second is Agora doesn't have like five paid newsletters. They have like hundreds and hundreds and mm -hmm. hundreds. So what you just described is just the modern day version of that. And you could build that with far fewer employees, far fewer writers, if you hit right. AI correctly. Well, the other thing is, so going going back to Agora and their model and why it's brilliant is, and going back to how do you make $10 million in a year? Like if you build a, news, a paid newsletter that brings in a million dollars in revenue, like chances are your margins are 90 plus percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is it crazy that that business is worth <clears throat> 10 to 12 times profit. I wouldn't say it's crazy. It's not crazy. You're yeah. you're within a five or 10x yeah. if you wanted to sell it. Yeah. So, but again, like that's what's so, and we have why this. Why would you sell it? Yeah. We have this conversation all the time because it's like, A, why would you sell it? Because the cash it's throwing off is amazing and essentially autopiloted. And B, it's not just that asset, it's that now you have all those people that you can sell other products to. Mm -hmm. So why would you sell that? The only reason you'd sell it is if you can't get a mortgage to buy this apartment. <laughs> so here's the thing though. Okay, a couple interesting things on that, right? The idea that our, we're gonna have paid newsletters as of right now that are 300K a year between mm -hmm. Write With AI, Fiction Writing, and then Write Your Way to Wealth. We wanna build that to a million this year. If someone came and offered us 10X on that, I'd probably sell it at a million for 10. Just but I thought. think that's only because of where because we are Because right the relative now. to our, but if you yeah. were higher up, you wouldn't do that. So it is a function, but an interesting way to think about this, and I've been chatting with him is like, if you look at building a portfolio of cash flow businesses and some of the ones that are more sustainable than the others, like if you have three paid newsletters that all generate 300K a year, because that's, you know, 5,000 people paying you 20 bucks a month, that is so decentralized in terms of how likely that is to go to zero. Yeah, your risk it's is It's extremely so low. sustainable as long as you keep writing it. Because like, say you hired a writer and the quality took a 10% hit and you stopped giving it any attention, the bleed out on that would still be years and years and years of that cash flow. Mm -hmm. So if you can match some of your personal recurring expenses like that $28,000, like how, if you could that's match your question. mortgage that's 30 grand to a paid newsletter with a thousand people paying you 30 bucks a month. And that was, you had almost pure confidence that that wasn't going anywhere over the next 10 years, you'd buy the house. Of course, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, everyone should have, a, I think, a paid newsletter or a paid community to yes. do, um, which is, sim is similar. Like we have, a, we have a paid, you know, we call it a membership, paid membership that is like part paid newsletter, part community, and we charge a hundred dollars a month for it. Mm. And like, dude, we had 20 signups in the last 24 hours. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's like Two, lifestyle cash flow matching is Two, an interesting topic. Yeah. $2,000 a month. Okay. But so to take this a step further, because it's wild, I don't see anyone on Substack doing this. Like, even the biggest newsletters, the, the missed opportunity is realizing that the recurring revenue is the beginning, not the end. So what you what happens is you have all these creators that go, I started a paid newsletter, and then they reach success. The, you have paid newsletters on sub, Substack doing hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars a year. And then they don't sell them anything else. So immediately, the whole equation 
looks different when you go and 10% of the people who are paying me on a monthly basis also bought the $20 ebook that I put together or also bought the $200 course I put together. And I don't understand why more people don't. And then to take that a step further, right? Then you can take all your paid newsletters and at the end of the year, you can bundle them into a book. Right. So now there's another product. Well, like the way I would, so the way I would do it, and I'm curious your thoughts, is I wouldn't start by adding like digital assets to start selling them. I would think about what is the most like 0.1% experience I could offer to this group. So for example, like with Community Empire, our paid membership and, and email would, you know, maybe I do something like instead of $99 a month for $500 a month, like you can have, you know, a, din a monthly dinner with someone from our mm. team or like something for the diehard fans. Like what's, or dinner once a year, you have dinner with me. Yeah. You know, as long as, I think that experience is also an option, but it's like, what are you solving for? And being careful about your time involvement. Yeah. Yeah. What, do you time, want, what do you want to commit time, to? Yeah. Time, this is what, it's taken <clears throat> both of us a long time to start to internalize this, but time is always the easiest thing to increase something in the short term. Totally. Like we know we're like, oh, if we give away our time, we will increase revenue on literally anything this month. That's right. But mm -hmm. then we're screwed. Like now we're out of hours. Now mm -hmm. we can't do anything. So. A, a, a middle ground solution, something that we do a lot, is uh, an experience bonus would be if you have a paid newsletter, you have a thousand people on it, and then you go once a quarter, I'm gonna do a live uh, workshop, but it's paid. So it's like 100 bucks, 150 bucks, hop on Zoom, and here's the topic, here's what we're gonna drill into. That's an easy way of increasing the LTV, but also giving an experience. You can take the recording, you can add the recording to your archive in the paid newsletter, you have an asset that compounds. Mm -hmm. Like That's a nice little middle ground versus a lot of people are like, buy my premium and I'll do an hour of coaching with you yeah. a month. And then all of a sudden you're out of hours and you can't build anything else. It's funny, I see like a lot of solopreneurs do that. And so like they tweet about, oh, I escaped my job. And then it's like, and I built this like, hey, I you're built on this Zoom new calls. job. Yeah, I built this new job. Most so we're making the exact same, except I'm working twice as hard. I'm still selling my time. Solopreneurship is just a high paying job. Which in the beginning is great. Yeah. Awesome. Like if you're, if you're brand new to making 10 grand a month, that's what you should do. Totally. But that's not gonna get you to- To 10 million. Yeah, no. no. Yeah, well, no, I wanna talk about 10 million during this, you know. I know I'm with the right people to talk about it with. Well, there's only one way to get the apartment. You gotta, <laughs> think, you gotta think bigger. You gotta think bigger. Okay, so paid, paid newsletters. Do you have any specific ideas besides anything in pets that, you know, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, you'd, you'd go after? Um, I think if, if we didn't have anything that we were doing right now, but so say Dickie and I sold everything that we had right now and we were starting completely over. I feel like because of our personal interests, the next thing we would build would be like a, how to think about finance as a, as a guy in your mid twenties to pre 40. Yeah. Cause I think that specific window of person is, and not to like exclude others, but it's just that type of person has such unique challenges and questions and things at that phase of life. <clears throat> I think we both would get. I would a start a page. Someone actually messaged us in our Slack uh, that my writing has been like my writing over the last month has been extremely personal to me for the most part. It's like, what am I learning? What am I thinking about? And I want to get back into doing that more. And he asked if I was going to start a paid newsletter to talk about these topics because I don't want to go down that like as much as it's fun to talk on social about that i think there's something there's like a stigma to talk about dating or finance or mm -hmm. like to you just don't want people quote tweeting you when you talk about money on twitter it's way better usually like, doesn't end well <laughs> it, like once that escapes to npc twitter it just becomes so toxic that you have to put some kind of paywall before you talk about a lot of those things so yeah. i don't know why why do you say that because people can't understand. Yeah, you can't if wrap you your talk head about it. making millions of dollars, like it's going to offend people. Yeah, the average person, especially on Twitter, gets extremely offended at the idea that people have money. Yeah, totally. so you have to put up some kind of paywall. Luckily, I don't think anyone listens to this podcast that no, thinks that no, no. way. Because if you're listening to this podcast, like you're you're you have a bias for action to do things right. and to to better yourself. But yeah, yeah you're right. I, I have gotten things. I've gone viral on Twitter, and then I look to see like all these anonymous accounts. Yeah, you, like, 
completely. So it's not good for you because it, it disincentivizes you to keep writing about it. Versus yeah. if you write a small $50 a month paid newsletter to a hyper-specific group that engages with every single thing, then there's no point to write on social about it. Because yeah. you just have this group who's telling their friends. If you can write a paid newsletter where your only marketing is people forwarding it to a friend and saying, hey, you got to sign up for this, that's the sweet spot. Yeah. there, And it's worth saying, this happens at every level. Like, if you're jamming with a small business owner that's doing, you know, 200K a year, and you walk into the room and you're like, you got to think bigger. This is how you get to 10 million. A lot of them don't want to have that conversation. They're like, I like where I'm at and I don't need, you know, it's like threatening. And then you go to a different room and it's people with $5 million businesses and someone's like, hey, you got to think bigger to get to 50. Not everyone in that room is wants to have that conversation. So that that friction happens at every level, you know? And so that's part of why it's so difficult to find people to talk about money with. Cause like a lot of it comes down to what level are you at and where do you want to go with it? So you'd start with a, a paid newsletter on that topic. And then where do you think you would take it from there? Uh, I mean, I think of all the businesses that we've built in the past three years, we've learned that the group coaching model is the fastest to scale, mm -hmm. probably most profitable like probably doing another group coaching program would be low hanging fruit because you can get a group coaching program to, t to five, 10 million. Like if you have a good category, you can do that. And group coaching, meaning like a, how yeah. often do you do it? Like what, what, what does that look like? Well, the way PGA, for example, is structured is it's like a one to many. It's async curriculum. Plus we have team members that specialize in different things to answer questions. So there's real time support. We'll do like a weekly hot seat that's live. So there's an async component. There's a live component. There's a community component. So you have all these different things working to either teach someone, hold them accountable, gamify the journey, you know, whatever it is. Um, and you can do that in a lot more categories than people realize. The other thing I would do if I were you, and I was building this, is I would build a, a SaaS product along with it. So for, for for this audience, like basically mint.com just recently shut down. Yeah, yeah, I saw <clears throat> that, that was really surprising. Very surprising, but it's, it is and it isn't because it is because it was a, actually a great product that was, it was trying to do too many things for, it was trying to do something for everyone. Where I think niche personal finance is an interesting yeah. idea. Like yep. we use Copilot to manage our stuff. Copilot for X, basically. Right, exactly. Is 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 the uh -huh. idea. So Copilot for the people who don't know is basically mint.com, track your net worth, track your credit cards, track your personal stuff. Um, but yeah, you it, it was it was everything in the kitchen sink. It got to that point because it was bought by Intuit. Mm -hmm. Um, not surprisingly. Like they make QuickBooks, you mm -hmm. know. And obviously the QuickBooks people aren't gonna make the like most beautiful streamlined products in the in the no. world. You know? <laughs> so Copilot came in a couple, two, three years ago, and it's just a simpler mobile first version. And I heard they're killing it. Um, they're probably doing Copilot. It. Yeah, it's only like six bucks a month. I think. It's, yeah. But, yeah. Well, it's I use it. it I showed off, you my workflow yeah, for using the it. The product's like that. beautiful. Yeah. It started off at I think a dollar ninety nine a month. Yeah. And then if you three x your prices and no, and you're still growing, definitely. The, that's a good sign. Yeah. So, is there an opportunity to build Copilot for X? Um, for different niches. That's just kind of an interesting mm. problem. Yeah, I think that's the way to think about it. You know, like, especially with all the new, like, no code tools, AI tools, I think you're going to get a lot of smart, driven individual people just sitting at their laptop being like, I built the co pilot for pet owners of border collies. <clears throat> yeah, right. did you listen <laughs> to the most recent All In from this past weekend? Do you guys listen to All In? Very, very um, rarely. I think I listened to like half of it. So uh, Friedberg had, David Friedberg worked at Google doing a bunch of stuff. He had this really interesting idea of SaaS being like this moment in time blip in terms of a viable business model between software that you had to download on your computer and then software that can be written by AI. Where now the ability for an individual to spin up a more specific version of all the oh, end to end uh, yeah. SaaS that are trying to do everything for everyone is only going to decrease, right? So if you have someone in house, if the most productive engineers can become 10 times more productive using AI to code, and they're able to build these products in house, that model goes away in an interesting, like that's an interesting thread to pull on is how many SaaS platforms could you actually 
better tailor for your individual experience that aren't that difficult to build with Copilot and other AI coding tools. And so I actually just sent a newsletter this morning speaking to this. Mm. But the one thing that I speak to about in the newsletter is also the business model changes. So the way SaaS works today is you pay a monthly fee, mm -hmm. six ninety nine a month, and you get access to the software. Where I think things are going is it's going to be pay per task. Yeah, the chat should be T. Or like back to one time purchase. One -time the, purchase. the base camp guys just launched their one Slack. Time. Yeah, Slack killer or something like that. And it's just you pay for it once, like old school, buy a CD, put yeah. it in your computer. That's basically where it's But going. the reason why I'm so fascinated with this is because of the, the idea of LTV relative to just recurring revenue. Because I feel like a lot of times people will create products that recur and they think, if once someone signs up, that recurring revenue never goes away. But really, there's always some sort of tipping point, you know? So you're like, okay, my average churn, I know net net, my LTV on an average customer is $215, you know? So it's interesting to either have some of that data or sort of speculate what that data would be and go, okay, well, if my average LTV is going to end up being around 200, why don't I just remove the recurring option and sell full access for 300 bucks? Right and capture all that LTV up front and force a different purchasing decision. Totally. Or even if you have an idea for Copilot for X, you can build the landing page, build the mockups and be like, you know, post on Twitter, hey, hey you can pre-sell it. Pre-sell mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Like to fund your your development. I think a lot of more people are going to do that. So many different rabbit holes you could go down with that. Like yeah. If you have fewer engineers working at every company but more solo engineers building things. Yeah. I want to talk quickly, even though it's like off topic, about uh, a conversation I had with someone in my Miami the other day. So he, we went for coffee, and he was telling me about uh, a particular person on Twitter that was showing these MRR numbers for a particular business. And I happen to know what the MRR was. Was it a SaaS? It was a services-based business. I happen to know the revenue of that and basically the monthly I, I get the updates for that particular business and it was a person that was basically posting on twitter and saying hey i get you know i got 10 million dollars of revenue 10 million in arr divided by 12 mrr and she, and he was like really upset about it because he's like i'm out here i'm trying i have a, you know almost a million dollars ar it took me eight years and i was like dude don't believe what you read hmm. <laughs> like don't make it you shouldn't feel bad logging onto Twitter and seeing that because it's not even truthful. Hmm. Yeah, most of it isn't. It's not. And most numbers are just like, if I see another agency owner put <laughs> that they have 50 million in business pipeline by taking people who fill out a type form, like how can you say that you have, it's just type formers. That's like saying if I took every email subscriber I have and multiplied them if they bought all my products and said, I have 100,000 email subscribers, and they all pay me a hundred dollars, so I have ten million dollars in email pipeline. You know what this is like. <laughs> I I worked at an ad agency right out of college, and we used to have this joke where you like ad agencies are so liberal with how they talk about things. It's like walking into Walgreens and buying toilet paper and being like, Walgreens is a client. Yeah, <laughs> it's like like that's literally what people are doing on Twitter. They're no. like they're like, oh, you know, Walgreens is a client. It's like really, it's like well, yeah, I mean, their toilet paper is great. Yeah, they're even client. worse. Walgreens is a partner. Yeah, I'm, I've, I've, I've partnered with uh, yeah, introducing Walgreens North America. Our new partnership yeah. with it, Walgreens. There's a lot of context stuff, like people taking lifetime revenue and calling that the revenue of their business. Mm. So they'll be like, I've done you know five million bucks over the past five years. And then you'll see them go on podcast being like, how I built a $5 million business. That's not a $5 million business. That's a $1 million business that's been around for five years. That's right. And like all those little nuances it just makes it's just sad because then you're all the people that want to learn yeah. mm. are looking at that and and it's literally like you're you're giving them a broken version of the game yeah. to start and then they walk in with all these unrealistic expectations that's not how any of these businesses operate and that's why i wanted to bring it up it's it's for the people listening who are embarking on the 10 million dollar journey and might see things on the internet and people you know quote unquote sharing in public so they're taking it as the gospel. We should set some standards that there's just a collective group of people who 
go around policing anyone who doesn't talk in monthly <laughs> free cash flow that hits your bank account. Yeah. Monthly okay, that too. net free cash flow post expenses yeah. is the only number that matters in your business. Period, yeah. full stop, and a story. Yep. So yep. what Agreed. is 50 million in business pipeline? Like, okay, but we're actually doing 300K a month at 40% margin. So it's 120K a month free cash flow. Uh huh. Divide, that, divided by three partners at, three, at plus expenses, <laughs> which means I make 20 grand a right. month. <laughs> after tax, really, it should be personal, monthly, after tax, free cash flow. And then you could bubble that up to the business level. Yes. And every time there should be like a like a Chrome extension that every time, <laughs> like every time you see $10 million, it's like, it's the Twitter community notes. It's like doing the math on this business. It's more than likely that this business That's owner takes home twenty thousand dollars a month because that normalizes it for everyone. What is the amount that hits your bank account after all expenses at the end of every month? That's such and if a you good didn't talk in that, idea. you should just get can't, like yeah. Every, there should be an army of reply bots. To be like, this is the monthly free cash flow bot. This number is bullshit. <laughs> Like imagine that Twitter that, would be such a better place. That that actually leads me to another idea related to this. We should build that <laughs> Coffeezilla for tech entrepreneurs. Yeah, seriously, like huge yeah. audience opportunity. Like people would share that like crazy, mm -hmm. and you can monetize that. That's that's actually a great niche YouTube channel. So for people who don't know Coffeezilla, YouTuber, probably three plus million subscribers, and he exposes scams yeah. um and it's just like a guy with he like goes a, after crypt, crypto mostly he's gone right? after crypto he's gone after one like jake paul too or yeah, something with his traders. nfts yeah, yeah, yeah so you get these like well-known people and he he's like a journalist about it like he has integrity i bet yeah and he he really uh does a great job so and people share that right because you know well number one People like to see other people fail. Let's be real. Well, it's like the business world's TMZ, yeah, you know? Totally. That's a better way of describing it. Hmm. Like, there was a point, Gawker, do you remember Gawker? Oh, yeah. You know, tell, tell people what Gawker was for, most people don't remember. I mean, it was like a, a news publication, but they would like do hit pieces yeah. and they would like go after people. Ryan Holiday wrote a whole book about the Gawker story going like Hulk after. Hogan and yeah. stuff, yeah. Right? I, Wasn't I don't that know. him? I don't know too much about Gawker, to be honest. It was basically like, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was like a gossip column for for business. Yeah. They shut down after the lawsuit, right? They shut down. Because they think, went bankrupt? Well, Peter Thiel, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sued them. If anything, yeah. the, the <laughs> old, like, uh, this whole fiasco that happened with open AI and yeah. how it was like the coolest thing to ever happen to anyone who worked in Silicon Valley because they got to talk about it. It was like keeping up with the Kardashians for nerds in San Francisco. It's yeah. like the most important thing and all they could, they'd wake up and like check the news, be like, what's Sam doing now? Literally, myself included. Yeah. I did that for 48 hours. You know, that was an interesting thought experiment. I couldn't sleep. I was just thinking about Sam Altman all night. <laughs> yeah. I didn't like that. Just, I don't know. That didn't interest me at all. I was like, that just seems weird. Cool. Like he's either going to work there or not work there. Um, yeah. You know, the, okay. The other one that gets me is the person who goes, I made all this revenue only working one hour a day. And I'm like, nobody does that. <laughs> you, like, or, or also the joke of like the morning routine thing where it's like, you look at all these entrepreneurs, they're like, I'm awake at 3 a.m. I've had a full protein breakfast <laughs> and red light sauna and I've run seven miles by 4.30 a.m. You know, and it's like, you're looking at this and you're like, maybe you've done that one time, you know? And then, and just like the person who takes the pipeline and like rounds up, <laughs> they do it one time and they're like, and in theory, if I did do this every day, that would be my morning routine. And then they make people feel bad because they're not. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. all. It's like, oh, I, I woke up and I was tired this morning. Like I was about to tweet this and I didn't, but I had to like draft it. I was like, I woke up yesterday and I basically woke up. I flooded myself with coffee. I took a nice warm shower. I woke up at 7.30 a.m. I woke up at 7.30 a.m., flooded myself with like four coffees. Great Literally morning. drowned myself in coffee. <laughs> took a coffee bath. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, I took a warm, long shower. Not like a cold bath. Just a warm, long shower. Soup. It was warm. I even, I busted it even hot, hot, hot. It's like steam everywhere. Can, can I give you an upgrade? You got to buy these uh, shower steamers. Do you have shower steamers? No, do I need one of those? Dude, it's like a know. it's like a bath bomb for a shower. 
Really? Oh my gosh, it feels like you're in a spa. It's amazing. You just unwrap it, you throw it at the bottom, the water comes down, and Another it smells great like e-com lavender. Really? Amazing. Yeah. You oh, keep yeah. buying it. Do you know how expensive mm, those super things high are margin. too? You get a bag of like 12 of them for like 40 bucks or something. Damn, I'm yeah. like, add it to your shower routine. Yeah. This I, is something I'm trying to do more though, because right now. Wait, I'm, wait, here's the idea. Ahead. Sorry. Oh, okay. What are they called? Steam shower uh, sh- sh- bombs? Shower steamers? For your dog. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, though, <laughs> or your dog. you know, they need a better bath. Yes, there it's like a CBD to make them calmer in the bath, you Dude. know, because dogs Are get stressed out about it. Dog? Do, yeah, right. <laughs> your dog hates the bath unless <laughs> they have bath CBD bomb. I would yeah. buy this right now, and for cats, right? Uh huh, and for, for your gerbils, fish. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, well cats hate, the, hate water, right? So, if you want to like make it a little more, it's like a dry cleaner, <laughs> no, but honestly, <laughs> honestly. That concept, steam showers, for the productive tech entrepreneur. So, like the product, the, the Andrew Huberman type guy. Oh, I mean, think about okay, how do they sell tea? You go into the, the tea aisle and it's just white label green tea, but one of them says calm and one of them says energy and one of them says focus. Right. You're going to buy the one that says the word of the thing that you associate with. That's right. So you could easily do that for any category or any niche. Take the tech entrepreneur and do yeah. shower steamers for raising your first round and you're stressed out. Yeah. I right? Think, yeah. Huberman's drink is going to, if if he started a drink that was like sparkling water, theanine, caffeine, everything that Nicotine. he recommends, everything that he recommends <laughs> you take in the morning and it was just called like, you know, and it's got nothing else and only marketed it to that specific type of person, it would yeah. crush. Yeah. Call it crush. sunrise and yeah. say only people who wake up before the sun gets up yeah. drink this. Like done. Do this and stare at the sun. Yeah. <laughs> the Dickie Bush. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think we're seeing the anti-Huberman effect right now. So that was a bit of my tweet that I was gonna write yesterday. I was I was gonna say I was gonna say like at the end of my here's what I did this morning. I I, today I felt like the anti Huberman. Yeah. What's the what's the oh in that you like don't have a morning routine? You don't routine optimize. And you just, you, yeah. This is I put this in the notes of the doc is like esoteric health Twitter is always two years ahead of like everyone else. Yeah. So they're they're already on that train of like anti optimization now, leaning more into like intuition and things like that. But I don't know. At, you know, at, there's both th- sides. There's always a trend and there's always an anti trend. Mm-hmm. And it feels like Huberman has gotten so big that, of course, you're going to have people be like, I don't want to do a cold plunge. I, want, I like my hot shower. I am sick of how many more people are in the sauna and cold plunge since it got popular, though. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's there ruined. are specific groups why? of people. Why? You, 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 like, why does it... Why does that make you mad? Well, I like to not talk to anyone. The worst are the people who are in the sauna now, just sparking up a goddamn oh my podcast God. conversation. Yeah, it's like, oh, let's just start talking to everyone. It drives like the last me thing I want to yeah. do. Yeah, no, that's why I say I'm unemployed when anyone asks what I do in the sauna. It's well, like, you shouldn't say you're unemployed because <clears throat> if you're unemployed, I have nothing to offer you. I have no conversation. <laughs> I got nothing for you, buddy. Yeah, I want to sit here no in job. silence. <laughs> if, if, if or accountant, someone, that if I, works. Uh, yeah, accountant is better. If I met. An unemployed person in the sauna. I'm like, I need an at a more. luxury gym. Yeah, I need it. I need I'm it. looking like, for <laughs> who are you? <laughs> Got nothing for you, buddy. That's yeah. like my like my mystery, go-to. You're mystery, you know, you're mysterious. You're wearing Lululemon. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I don't get it. Something isn't adding up. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, I hate I hate that. But there's a specific type of person that has started to do that. That only comes to the gym now to like sauna and cold plunge. Mm-hmm. And yeah. they're just getting their optimization routine in. That's and not doing a, anything else. I heard that's called the professional workout. Did you hear? Uh, the, you hear that? the executive workout. The executive no, a steam workout. room and a wheatgrass shot. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I used to do that one in New York every once in a while. A wheatgrass shot? Yeah. Oh, I thought you said a wheatgrass shower. No, I was a wheatgrass like, shot. The executive steam is for the your Friday dog? morning. Friday morning on Wall Street. That's a thing. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Okay. I want to. I want to end off with. Uh, I've got this note notes file of all these ideas i've got about 100 ideas in the, in there here. amazing nice i'm gonna give you a couple and you can tell me if it's you like them or you don't like them goodreads someone needs to reinvent goodreads mm. yeah i hate that platform like it's it's just a great idea like a social network around books um essentially and reviews around books Ooh. um what's it called uh, letterbox was recently acquired by tiny and andrew wilkinson hmm I can see and letterbox for for films. I can I could see like a letterbox level in terms of design for Goodreads. 
I feel like we're due for it. They were acquired by Amazon, I think, many years ago. I think a, a Goodreads for podcasts or a Goodreads for your Twitter feed would be interesting, right? What if you could integrate your Twitter feed mm. with like your liked tweets all went somewhere and then you could see and talk to or connect with other people who also like those same tweets or listen to those same podcasts. That could be kind of cool. Yeah, that's interesting. It, I mean, all this sort of just speaks to the broader trend, which is there's just way too much content. Yeah. Like we just can't consume all of it. So you're probably going to see, same with that niching down idea, more and more platforms that are like, here's how to parse just the feed on Twitter versus here's how to parse just the podcast you listen to on Spotify versus just the videos you watch on YouTube. You know, it's just too much. Too much. So you, what do you think? What would you rate that that idea on 10? Eight. Um, eight. No I would, sevens, no sevens. I would use it. I'd use it more. I don't like Goodreads. Yeah, I, I never really used Goodreads. I don't know. I know people who use it to count the number of books they read. That's it. Mm. It's like they add the books that they read to it. But I don't know. I wouldn't be excited to work on it, but I would use it. I, I feel like a cooler. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That, yeah. There's my summary. That's, that's a good answer. Honestly. <laughs> I feel like a cooler feature is uh, isn't in Amazon Kindle like, and I don't I don't use it, but I just know of it where you can see how many other people have highlighted yes. the same sections. Like that to me is a lot cooler. Yeah. Um, but that's how you can start. That's how I would start off. Goodreads 2.0 would be probably that. Mm -hmm. I think Readwise yeah. is probably trending in that direction. Yeah, some kind of consolidation of all the highlights. Yeah, true. Cool. Can I can I give you one of my business ideas? Yeah. All right. So one of mine is I think that the next Simon and Schuster or Penguin Random House or whatever is going to be one individual that builds, I mean, one author, but has like a whole team. So the, an author is being treated like a venture back startup and the team and that author train an entire model on how that specific author outlines a certain type of story, how they write it, vocabulary choices, like really, really in depth. And then it allows that author and that style to you then have the ability to create a book a week or a book a day. And you can just flood an entire subcategory. So imagine James Patterson could actually do this right now. James Patterson's like, I want to write thrillers. He already writes, co-writes with other people. He's doing the manual version of it with another author. He does a book a month. Okay, well, if he took the time and built a model, he could write a James Patterson level book a day. And I, that's going to happen. It's just a question of who goes and builds it, how long does it take, and you have to have enough of a library to train the model on you. Because the problem, you see it with now like OpenAI, that was the whole issue, is like you can't go train your model on other people's content without those other people going, hey, what the hell? That's right. So mm. the solution is you have to have produced enough volume to train the, the model on you, and you're the copyright owner, and the problem and why James Patterson can't do this is because his publisher owns all his stuff. So now there's a conflict. So is the publisher going to build it? Is he allowed to build it? You know, but I'm really fascinated by the idea of what does it look like for an author to create a book a day and have it actually be 80, 90% quality of what you would produce on your own. Yeah. I mean, the average author does what a book every three years, two, three years. Yeah. If that yeah. five years, I think it's an, in it's interesting. And he, he was the one who broke that model and went, I want to do, I mean, there were a couple authors before him, but he was really the one that went, I want to do two or three or four books a year. Mm -hmm. And then now, as far as I know, he's one of the only authors that cranks out consistently a book a month, every month, year after year after year, mm -hmm. he's doing the manual version because he's working with other writers. Yeah. My guess is, this also translates pretty well to music. Oh, same thing's gonna happen. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I like this idea. It's probably like an eight seven. Eight seven yeah, for you? Seven. You said no sevens. Eight oh, eight point seven. seven. Oh, oh, okay. 8. 8. 7. Cool. Yeah. I'll take it. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> you got any good ones, Siki? <laughs> it's not something I actually do much. It like brainstorm random business size. Like I don't have that note. I was just how my brain works. <clears throat> See, I was yeah. I wrote something the other day that I love to learn, but I'm not curious at all where I don't go down internet rabbit holes about random things. And I felt guilty for that for a long time. But like random ideas and going down and spending like 10 hours on YouTube, I don't like to do, I don't know. I think one of us needs to have that trade. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing right now? And what's the next logical step? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I felt guilty, but now I'm kind of leaning into it as a superpower. No, right? it's it's great in the opposite way. Yeah. Yes. You know, because 
I just don't care about how the world works. People are like, I'm fascinated by how the world works. I'm like, I just care that it works. I don't really care at all about how. Right. Uh, last idea before we before we. I go. love that about you. <laughs> One of us has to. So I'm uh, looking to buy some art, and I got a great. I got an artist that you should buy. Okay. He's on the up and up, and I think I think that you could tick the. Tick the yeah. Okay. Yep. We'll, we'll talk about that. I'll, I'll put you on to him. Yeah. There doesn't seem to be a good marketplace for secondhand curated art. Isn't that what Masterworks or Master something? In what way? What do you mean by that? So there's places where I can buy art that other people have owned before. Of course, there's Artsy, which is like the big platform. Do you guys know Artsy? Mm -mm. It's basically like the Amazon for art, but they have like pieces in the tens of millions or millions of dollars Mm. to pieces that are $100. And some of them are like new pieces and some of them are someone else, you know, used, so to speak. I think there's probably an opportunity to do a marketplace with curated pieces, meaning it's not as overloaded with like, here's one million pieces. Here's maybe a subset Um, and also the ability to rent pieces. I was actually just thinking that like a Airbnb, I want to rent your Picasso for the weekend because I'm throwing a party. Yeah. It'd be kind of cool. Hmm. There's a huge level of risk in that, obviously. But yeah. renting pieces is seems interesting. It also is like Gen Z and millennials, our attention span is a lot less. So it's like, yeah, I might enjoy this Picasso for a weekend. <laughs> but like, I don't know. Maybe. I hate it now. Yeah. I think about that a lot with like the hedonic adaptation of nice things, like renting a nice car. Yeah. You can get 90% of the benefit. And then, mm-hmm. then you like if you rent a really nice car for three days, on the fourth day you start to pick out things about the car that you don't like, mm. and that's like when you should give it up, yeah. because then that's you a own, great point. When you own it full that's time, you're like, damn, like I went to Germany and rented a Porsche to drive on the autobahn, and it was sick the first two days. And I remember returning it on the third day, being like, fucking kind of cramped in here. <laughs> like, and I remember I was like, that's a perfect time <laughs> to get rid of that thing, right. yeah. because the second you have any kind of complaint, I think the same thing goes for like apartments or I don't know, apartments might be different, but cars or art or things like that. How can you get 90% of the upside with just the initial access and then not make it into something that owns you in the long term? It's a good yeah. point. And maybe this is a narrative I put, I'm putting in my head, but after this conversation, I feel like apartments and homes doesn't fit in that category of, you, you know, you don't, I don't think you get used to a beautiful home. Like I feel like or do you? I don't know. Like you, if, if, you definitely do. You definitely do. So then, why would I buy this apartment? Be, I, so my argument, though, is because it is the place where you most likely spend the majority of your time, and so it's sort of like your bed. Like of all the things to max out, you should probably max out the thing that you spend six, seven, eight hours a night and every night for your whole life. You know, and your home, I think, is very similar. You spend, especially now that we all work from home and like, why, why would you not want to optimize that? Whereas a car, it's like, Uh, and and I I think it all comes back to it. What's the pressure it puts on you mm -hmm. relative to the enjoyment or the, you know, I think the solution is have someone that prevents you from thinking about the house in a negative way at any time, which basically if shit stops working, you actually don't even realize it. Someone is there to repair it. There's like an on call, right? Because otherwise you're just like, bitching about your $30 million house and what sucks about it. Yeah. And that's just a place you want to avoid. In you don't want to be there, <laughs> which will happen. Cause like your toilet's going to break. Right. And that's going to be and annoying. Fucking house, you know? <laughs> yeah. Dude, this has been so That was good. pretty solid. This is solid. Kind of, kind we, of we, we, I'm proud of us. We got some good juice going. This is, <laughs> I like this. It's all, it's all because of the shipyard. It's all because it's of the shipyard. So here. thank you for, for inviting me here and, and allowing this. We should do this more. We yeah. should make this a standing thing. Yeah. I would love that. I think the first of many. I would love that. Um, where could my audience go and find out more about what you get? They'll do? find us. Find us on Twitter, Dickie Bush or yeah. Nicholas Cole 77. Yeah. Start they'll, they'll, they're they're smart. They're they'll, smart. they'll find us. They'll yeah. find us. Yeah. 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 I have this uh, a heuristic that I've kind of been using is if with all of the things that we create, if you can't find your way to the thing, that's a little bit of a signal. Like Yeah, but we... There's also the counterpoint. We create so many things that like, where should you go? That's yeah. true. But yeah, okay. That's, that's fair. But also just like, just Google it. Yeah. yeah. You know, totally. <laughs> I had this, I had this happen the other day. Uh, we had, we're hiring like a product designer and I had posted about it 
and I had said, go apply on the, on the website. So some, someone, some guy reached out to me and he was like, Hey, like I can find like the job at the job, like the career section on, on the late checkout website. I hate to break it to you, but that's a signal. That's yeah. a signal. I, and it's like, I'm, I had to respond. I was like, Hey, like, the best little hack Sorry. I found for that is when we're inter interviewing someone, ask them to send you the calendar invite for the time you send them. Mm. Ah, and just like see that they can one. fucking check a box of right. schedule it at the right time, add a Zoom link, X, Y, Z. It's like the first little micro test of their general competence. Yeah. <laughs> another, another one that gets me is like, we'll tweet something and then we'll append it and go, and by the way, if you want to start writing, check out Ship30 yeah. with a link to Ship30.com. And then someone will comment and say, what's Ship30? If you click the link, the entire site will tell you what it is, you know? And like that, it's such a small thing. Or sorry, one more, because I've been doing all these interviews for a new hire we're making. Another one is you send a Cal invite and then I'll send the person an email and say, great, chat with you then. Let's use the Zoom link in the description. I can't tell you how many people go sit in the Google Meet link. And that to me, yeah. it's such a small thing, but I'm like, that shows me just that small level of detail that you're not, you know? That's the clip. <laughs> you're fired. I find you in the Google Meet, it's just gotta, there's someone waiting in there to be like, sorry, you failed the first step of this job application. Please don't apply again. Yeah. No, seriously, there's there's this, sorry, real real quick. Yeah, just, there's this, have you seen Get The Bear? I gotta say, no. have, have you seen The Bear? No. Oh my God, amazing show. Yeah. Okay, but there's this scene where they're hiring like a maitre d' and they're doing the interview and the girl is like, oh, she was great. I think we should hire her. And the guy is like, there's no way we're hiring that person. She's like, why? The interview went so well. And he points to one of the place settings and he had like turned it. So there were three the right way and one was wrong. And he was like, she just sat here the entire time and did a 45 minute interview and didn't fix that place setting. Mm -hmm. That would have driven me nuts. No attention to detail. We're not hiring that person. And like that, it's the Zoom, it's the Zoom thing. It's like, you know, or someone emails me, they put an H in my name. I'm mm -hmm. like, immediately, I'm like, <laughs> you don't have attention to detail. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard. Totally. My name's not Craig, it's Greg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw a new one for you. It's Nicholas Cole, K O H L, like Cole's the shopping thing. Cole. I was like, I've seen a lot of names for you. I've never seen Nicholas that's, Cole that's like good. this I, So this would be a good time to announce I am part of the Cole's empire. Yeah, uh, I knew it. <laughs> that's actually, the shipyard was actually funded by the yeah. Cole's empire. Oh, man. Yeah. So attention to detail, everyone. Yeah. yeah there you go. That's, that, that'll get you to 10 million. Thanks, everyone. All right, y'all. Later. Boom.